Taffers, is it a hot take to say Bioshock 2 is the best Bioshock? It's far superior to the ambitious but convoluted Infinite and takes from the foundation that Bioshock laid down and improves on it in almost every single way. Bioshock 2 did sell well, yet at large the game seems to be somewhat forgotten and less fondly remembered in various circles, beyond the Minerva's Den DLC regarded as one of the best DLCs around. Why has that been the case for Bioshock 2? The first Bioshock is well remembered and discussed even in the year that was released in 2007, one of the strongest years in regards to releases in gaming history. Bioshock 2 sold well in 2010 and got great reviews but seems to have gotten lost in the shuffle compared to some of the other notable releases at the time, like Red Dead Redemption, Mass Effect 2, and of course, Sonic Freeriders. Bioshock 2 in a way is like the Rodney Dangerfield of the Bioshock series, it seems to get no respect. In years past, I've seen its reputation and discussion circles arise, and in doing research for this video, saw a number of articles in the last few years praising it as the best Bioshock, while Bioshock Infinite has declined, and in my opinion, my Taffer friends are rightly so. But that's a video for another day. Bioshock 2 has plenty to offer, and after recently replaying the game, I want to bring more awareness for those to at least check it out again. From the vastly improved gameplay, to a story that relied more on heart compared to the original which tried to mess with your head, and being ahead of the curve of the AAA quote-unquote dad simulator games that we saw through the 2010s and up to today, including Bioshock Infinite, Bioshock 2, like Rodney Dangerfield, deserves more respect. Please note for this video that I will not be covering Minerva's Den, for that will be a future video at some point and there will be a whole separate discussion. As far as the multiplayer went, I only played Bioshock 2 for the first time a few years ago and multiplayer was not available, so I have nothing really to say on that front. Give us honey! After the success of Bioshock, Ken Levine went off with some of the Bioshock team to work on what would become Bioshock Infinite, released in 2013. Jordan Thomas, the level designer for Fort Frolic in Bioshock 1, widely regarded as the best level in the game, and level designer of the memorable Shale Bridge Cradle from Thief Deadly Shadows, which I've done a full video on here, moved from Boston to California for 2K Marin, along with some of the other previous team, in 2008 to start working on the sequel for Bioshock. Jordan would fill the role of creative director of the game. There was a core team from the first Bioshock, along with new hires and working with 2K Australia. Not only were they putting together a game, they were also putting together a studio. On how Jordan Thomas ended up as the creative director for Bioshock 2, from one interview, I've asked myself so many times why he's picked to direct Bioshock 2. The reality is, while he's working on that first Bioshock, I sat next to Alyssa Finley. She became executive producer at Bioshock 2's developer 2K Marin. She's the one who had watched me stay late every night. It was Alyssa who got in touch and asked me to come to California to work on the sequel. Unlike the original, or Infinite, which had development times at around five years, the studio just had a little over two years to put out a sequel. Interesting note, the team received some outside help from various studios, including Immersive Sim Mainstay's Arcane Studios, who I've done a few videos on in the past. So how do you make a sequel for a game that doesn't really need a sequel? Well, Jordan's first pitch was to play as a former little sister in an underpowered return to Rapture, full of fertile trauma that would be uncovered as he went very Silent Hill. But told from a higher up, we think Bioshock can be a big shooter franchise like Gears of War or Call of Duty, and I thought, good lord, why did you hire me? But the team decided to focus on some areas that were still worth exploring, like the relationship between the big daddies and little sisters, one of, if not the most interesting aspect of Bioshock. Developers wanted to further examine some questions or things that they didn't get a chance to in the original and pursued forward. I'm daddy. No, I'm daddy. <laughs> Let's take a look at the improvements that Bioshock made upon the original, starting with the gameplay. Bioshock 2 is a great example of looking at player feedback with what worked and didn't work in the original and improving on it. Instead of dropping aspects altogether, something a title like Mass Effect would do, which was released around the same time. As great as the first Bioshock was, there were some notable shortcomings and flaws with the gameplay. The hacking in the original was a tedious process. Here, it's fairly quick and painless and it doesn't pause the whole world around you and it adds some more urgency to it. In the original Bioshock, you had to constantly shift back and forth between plasmids and weapons. Here, you have a weapon in one hand, and your other hand is for plasmids. Using weapons and plasmids at the same time makes for far more engaging front when it comes to combat. There's far more strategy and interesting combinations that you can make use of. 
However, it can be easy to fall into patterns earlier in the game and just stick with a couple plasmids and weapons without trying the other ones out. And yet this game kills two birds with one stone and how they encourage players to experiment along with doing research at the same time. One of the other major flaws and momentum killer in the first Bioshock was the research with the camera. Here, you click to film on an enemy and you get a few seconds to hammer them out with various attacks to build up points for research. In a system similar to character action games like Devil May Cry, the game rewards you with more points for trying different plasmids and weapon combinations. While not providing as many points, should use the same weapons and plasmids over and over. This is a great level of incentive to get the player to experiment with different combinations and plasmids. It can lead to us discovering different combinations that we might have not stumbled across otherwise. As a result, the gameplay in the original, which was enjoyable yet flawed, becomes quite a joy that didn't have me rolling my eyes realizing I had another combat encounter ahead of me as what happened near the end of Bioshock 1. One of the most disappointing things in the first Bioshock is the end of the game is we get to become a big daddy and, well, nothing really changes. But in Bioshock 2, they took the idea and ran with it. We are a big daddy, the first one to be successfully paired to a little sister. So all those weapons that we could only look at longingly in the first Bioshock, we can now use. The drill charge, for example, or the rivet gun. Now, we're not a super powerful big daddy, and it's not like we could just mow down splicers with ease, and in groups, splicers can still pack a punch. And of course, being a daddy means little sisters, one of the most, if not the most, fascinating aspect of the original Bioshock. And we get to explore it here in Bioshock 2 with greater depth on both the gameplay front and the story front. And let's look at how the two overlap. Like the original, Lil' Sisters make their way around Rapture with their big daddies who we have to take down, and with that, we have a few options. We can adopt them, from there we could take them to event and either harvest them, you monster, or rescue them, or we could carry them around with us to go collect some Adam from corpses, or I mean angels, and then decide with what we want to do with them. Do we want to harvest them now, you monster, or should we rescue them? We could help them find another way, no more living life behind a shadow. What's interesting to know is when we have a little sister with us is we're referred to as Daddy, while other big daddies are referred to Mr. B or Mr. Bubbles. Mr. B, don't make me carry you. Bad Daddy, bad. Some of the new comments they make with us on our sides are really adorable, yet very unsettling. A little sister telling Splicers to go play with Spooky Daddy when you lay down a decoy is probably my favorite one. Go play with Spooky Daddy! Gathering Adam is highly advisable because all the upgrades it offers, from gene tonic slots, more plasmids, and more powerful versions of plasmids. Of course, getting little sisters to collect more Adam isn't just straightforward. We have to set up a little defense perimeter beforehand. Lay down some traps, plasmids, and get yourself ready. These encounters happen in fairly open areas with multiple points of attack from splicers, so there's plenty of strategy here to keep an eye out on our little sister, ourselves, and where enemies are coming from. While these areas are optional, I found them very enjoyable and they did give a nice test of everything and to try out some of these different powers and a chance to do some filming. Because of the improved combat, these encounters can be really chaotic and fun where you're constantly checking which areas enemies are coming from, switching between plasmids and weapons to deal with them, while bouncing our health and making sure our little sister stays protected. It could be a fun little dance, it's a real shame that Bioshock Infinite didn't take a number of cues from Bioshock 2 on this front. So while we ourselves are a big daddy, even for more on equal footing with big daddies in the original, the developers did the right thing and introduced a rival for us to deal with that exceeds our strengths and powers. Uh oh, big sister is coming, coming now. There's a new heavy hitter in Rapture, and that's the big sister. This is one of the very first major design decisions in the development of Bioshock 2 and took a lot for the team to get right. They did a lot of motion capture with ballet dancers to get what they were looking for, and that was looking for something that's a cross between a ballet dancer and a three-legged dog. The big sisters are a result of little sisters getting older, growing large quickly due to Adam, and being driven insane. They'll come after us after saving or harvesting enough little sisters. Let's ensure that future sisters don't turn to one. To paraphrase Elvis, little sister, don't you do what your big sister done. The big sister makes a great antagonist and foe for us to deal throughout the game, instead of being extremely bulky, they are extremely agile. Instead of the low booming noises of the Big Daddy, these are replaced by high-pitched screams. Daddy, 
These are by far the toughest fights in the game, especially early on when you don't have that many weapons or plasmids. When you hear that piercing scream, you have about half a minute to get ready for a fight, so stock up and get some traps ready, because these are not easy fights. As you grow throughout the game, this anticipation changes. Early on, it's more of a, oh shit, a big sister, while later on, it becomes more of a, bring it on, big sis. The team was initially going to have just one big sister that you encountered throughout the game, but would run away after taking down a certain amount of health, but they decide not to go this route as it would fall into a predictable rhythm and cause frustration. On the other note of additions, there were some ideas and concepts early on tossed around about having little brothers, but those were cut fairly early on. The relationship between us being a big daddy, dealing with other big daddies, little sisters, and big sisters are the key drivers of the story in Bioshock 2, which we'll now look into. <laughs> One thing that's commonly said about Bioshock 2 is that the story doesn't hold a candle to the original, and let's look into why that's actually not the case. The first Bioshock is well remembered for its would you kindly twist, and for good reason. It's a fantastic plot twist that changes everything and how you look at the game. When people discuss the story of Bioshock, the plot twist tends to take the center stage, which is a bit of a shame because the rest of the story is really well done. And hell, it's not even this is like the first time Ken Levy made use of this kind of plot twist. System Shock 2, which I've done a video on, has a very similar plot twist to Bioshock, which Bioshock would take use of and tweak in a different way. The Polito form is dead, insect. Are you afraid? In a way, it's like The Sixth Sense or The Usual Suspects, where the plot twist is all everyone seems to remember or discuss, even though both of those films were excellent beforehand and why those movies work so well. With Bioshock 2, there is no major plot twist or revelation, which I've seen people use against it. To me, it's a strange thing. When you go to the plot twist well too many times, you end up like a Shyamalan. What Jordan Thomas had to say in an interview is, I knew that people who came back expecting a giant twist would be disappointed with its lack. But I also feel like repeating that formulaic kind of Shyamalan story would have led people saying Bioshock 2 was a carbon copy of the first game. In a way, it was a bit of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation for the team. The use of plot twists and the differences in stories reminds me a bit of Knights of the Old Republic 1 versus Knights of the Old Republic 2. I would be a poor teacher if I did not give you the answers you seek here now. Just a little spoiler warning, I'm going to discuss a bit about Coter 1 and 2 and the plot twists. Knights of the Old Republic 1 has the plot twist where you were revealed to once been the leader of the Sith, Darth Revan, and have now had their memories and powers wiped. Fantastic twist which changes everything that came before and the way it builds up to it. But when people talk about the story of Kotor 1, the rest kind of gets forgotten, while most discussion is focused on the plot twist, and for good reason, because it's very well done. Knights of the Old Republic 2, on the other hand, had no major plot twist or revelations like the original. In fact, at the end of the game, in the somewhat meta moment, Kreia addresses this fact. Perhaps you were expecting some surprise for me to reveal a secret that had eluded you, something that would change your perspective of events, shatter you to your core. There is no great revelation, no great secret. While Bioshock 2 doesn't reach that storytelling level that Kotor 2 does, it still is a fantastic story that is more emotion-driven than messing with your head that Bioshock was. And I've seen it mentioned that due to not having a plot twist made it a lesser story, which to be frank is a dumb, dumb argument if I ever heard one. Before we talk more about the plot, I want to talk a bit about the shortcomings. The, fir the game's first hour is pretty rocky and doesn't really pick up until you get to Ryan Amusements. Dr. Tenenbaum returns here, and then she's gone for the rest of the game, although she does pop up in Minerva's Den where she plays a much more prominent role. Initially, she was going to have a larger role in the story, but more aspects that were taken over by another character, which we'll be discussing shortly. On the note of Ryan, Bioshock 2 had some big shoes to fill when creating an antagonist that's as compelling as Andrew Ryan, and while Sophia Lan, the antagonist in Bioshock 2, is not as compelling as Andrew Ryan, she's a great addition to the Rapture lore, and does help with creating a story that's more emotionally driven and explores some of the ideas of Rapture. Remember, Eleanor, one must know the beast before it can be slain. Sophia Lam is a great antagonist to Andrew Ryan, as she is the opposite compared to Ryan with her beliefs in the collectivist versus his beliefs in the individual. This tests Andrew's character in having to resort to some nefarious tactics to have her locked up that goes against his beliefs. The tapes that we find of Ryan and his dealings with Sophia and the debates they have between one another are some of the highlights of the game. To have Ryan, all about the individual and not having to be censored, going against his beliefs to have someone who stands on the other side of his beliefs locked up is a really interesting conflict that brews within Ryan. One thing that Bioshock 2 does not get enough credit for is how it helps flesh out Andrew Ryan even more. 
While he's been dead now for a number of years, his shadow still holds strong over Rapture and its people, and to hear these tapes of his debates with Lamb, what he does to dispose of her, gives a lot more insight into who he is as a character. One of the tricky things that the game pulls off fairly well is inserting Sophia Lamb into the story, for as if she was such a prominent citizen in Rapture, why didn't we hear about her in the original? Well, the game does address this with Ryan using nefarious means to have her locked up, swept under the rug, and forgotten by the public at large. When she does return, it has been a number of years. Is it perfect? No, but it does a far better job than most other sequels or expanded works who struggle with answering the question of, why are we just learning about this character now? I do wish Bioshock 2 did go more into Sophia's reasoning and push her flaws a bit more to the surface with her collectivist thinking, because while they do, it wasn't to the extent that they did with Ryan in the first place. It would have been nice to have the game push back more on Sophia Lamb and her beliefs and her goals. While there's characters like Father Wales who help show the wrong in the ideas of Lamb along with Gil Alexander, they weren't as compelling of showing other sides of Ryan with characters like Fontaine or Cohen did in the original Bioshock. While Bioshock has a starting as an unknown factor coming into Rapture, only to realize how much we are connected to some of the major players as a result, Bioshock 2 makes it clear that we're a big daddy but uses the characters around us and how we're connected with them to drive a story that's more emotionally driven compared to the original. Well, let's take a look at some of these characters. I like to look a man in the eye when I give him my word. You and me, kid, we're going places. Sinclair is an interesting character that will be in contact with most of the game, like Atlas or Fontaine the original, but he is completely upfront about his vices and sins, and it's refreshing to see someone like that. And while it does feel like he'll turn on you at any time, he doesn't, and he's just so damn charming with that accent of his. Opportunity to raise up some uh, affordable housing. When Atlantic Express was constructing their luxury passenger line, this place was hollowed out beneath as flop houses for the railway crew. And to see him at the end of the game being turned by Lamb is a very tragic moment, that there's a lot of sympathy for him, even all of his nefarious dealings in the past. And our character does have a history with Sinclair, which comes about more later in the game. This is all great stuff when it comes to story and connecting these characters. In three levels, we'll encounter three people to decide their fates in part of the game's quote-unquote morality choices that were popular at the time. Grace Holloway, Stanley Poole, and Gil Alexander, aka Alexander the Great. At the climax of these levels, we could determine their fates, living or dying. What's great about these characters is how we're all connected to them and Sophia, our history with them, and also playing roles in being extension of Sophia Lamb and her ideas, and how they clash with Ryan's, like a good side character should. Grace Holloway, a singer blacklisted by Ryan, becomes one of Sophia Lamb's most vocal supporters and helps represent how Sophia Lamb made use of the down and out and the poor to drive her cause forward against Ryan, in a way similar to how Fontaine made use of the poor. While the first Bioshock mostly focused on the elite of Rapture, Bioshock 2 delved more into the down and out, the neglected by Rapture. As mentioned in one of the audio logs in the first game, someone has to clean the toilets down there. And we have a history with Grace, for she tried to take away our little sister that she raised for some time, who was Sophia's daughter, but we retaliated against her and broke her jaw. But more on who that little sister was in a bit. Stanley Poole, a journalist, was used by Ryan as a mole to get dirt on Sophia Lamb to give reason to lock her up. And he interviewed our character, calling us Johnny Topside when we discovered Rapture deep diving. After Sophia was arrested, Stanley Poole takes control of the area and throws extravagant parties and indulges in vices. When Sophia's daughter discovers what he's been up to, he sends her off to Fontaine's orphanage to be turned into a little sister who we would be paired with. He's killed many people to cover up his lies, and in the moment where we want to, he's quite pathetic with all that he's done. It's up to us if we want to kill him and get our revenge, or spare him and leave him with his fate. Then we have Gil Alexander, who with Sophia Lamb was to become her idea of being the collectivist individual to rule Rapture with all his knowledge of the city by being injected with great quantities of Adam, but instead goes insane and turns into, well, this. There was a bit of a missed opportunity here in regards to how these characters' fates were handled. While what you do does determine the differences in your ending that you get, they don't really play much of a factor in the game otherwise, beyond Grace briefly helping you shortly after you spare her, and that's it. It would've been nice to see some additional dialogue occur a few levels down, or they could help us in some way. Perhaps this is something they were going to put in the game, but the short development time made them chop it out. Now, there's one character I've been holding off mentioning until now, and it's because our relationship with her is the key driver of the story in the game. And revisiting Bioshock 2 leaves me feeling safe to say that the story in some ways is better than the original, 
and in many ways does this idea that they go with far better than Bioshock Infinite. Mom says I'm not to play with the other children because they are being raised on a diet of dog eat dog. Our relationship with Eleanor Lamb, daughter of Sophia Lamb, and once our little sister is the core of this emotionally driven story that would be used by other game, in which I'm referring to as the AAA Dad Simulator, but we'll get to that shortly. Eleanor Lamb was our little sister, and we were the first successful pairing between little sister and big daddy in Rapture. Our goal the entire game has been to reach Eleanor and save her. And along the way, she'll help us out with various messages that we talk to her through, and the game makes use of little sisters to tie our relationship together. How we treat the little sisters along the way, whether harvesting them or saving them, will be reflected back to us through Eleanor in the ending of the game. Near the end of the game, we finally reach her, and after a few obstacles thrown our way, she joins us as a big sister that we could summon with her sanity intact, and she'll demolish and fuck up everything in her path with the greatest of ease. It's a fantastic moment that we finally get to have her by our side, I would love for the game to add another level just because our time together with her ends up being far too short. Plus, it's great to have a big sister on your side now after all those encounters we've had previously against them. And when we reach the ending, depending on how we dealt with little sisters and the characters along the way of Stanley Poole, Grace Holloway, and Gil Alexander, we'll get a variety of different endings that are far more satisfying than what Bioshock 1 offered. Eleanor's choices will be reflected back at us, and depending on a few factors, we could have quite a bit of a say in the ending as well. But the core of this relationship between us and Eleanor, our little sister, and we as her big daddy, is what drives the plot forward in one that's more about the heart and less about the head that Bioshock 1 and an Infinite made use of. The team did the right thing in focusing on these relationships in the sequel for a game that didn't overly need a sequel, and they made the most of it. I'm daddy. No, I'm daddy. <laughs> Earlier, I made mention that Bioshock 2 was ahead of the curve when it came to games that I like to dub the AAA Dad Simulator. So what are those exactly? The Last of Us, Bioshock Infinite, God of War, and even The Witcher 3 made use of some of these Dad Simulator cues from Bioshock 2. While I'm not sure if these games did take cues from Bioshock 2, it should be noted that Bioshock 2 did beat these titles to the punch by a number of years. I wonder if Ken Levine saw what the team was doing and was influenced by that. So let's first compare it to Bioshock Infinite, in which Elizabeth joins us fairly early on and stays with us for most of the game, although their relationship takes time to form and for them to trust one another and grows over the game. We do eventually learn about the history between the two of them, but at the beginning of the game, they are strangers to one another. Of course, the relationship is different due to the nature of having a voice protagonist with Booker DeWitt. While she does toss us some ammunition or coins, she doesn't really help us mess shit up like Eleanor does at the end of the game. Although looking at earlier builds of Bioshock Infinite, it did look like it would go that way. But that's a topic for another day. This is also different than 2 in when we're trying to find Eleanor for most of the game as she awaits us. For The Last of Us, it's very similar in structure for the father-daughter relationship that's in Bioshock Infinite. And fine to note how close together these games were released, with Troy Baker as the voice of the dad figure in each, that being Joel in Last of Us and Booker in Bioshock Infinite. Same case of taking time to trust one another and how their relationship grows and plays a large part in why these games have resonated so much over time due to the emotional punch that you can make use of these kind of stories. The Witcher 3 is more in line with Bioshock 2 as we spend most of the game finding Ciri, who we have a past relationship with and are very important in each other's lives, and Yennefer being the motherly figure. And we spend a long time getting to Ciri. It's interesting that amongst these group of games that Bioshock 2 gets lost in the shuffle as being ahead of the curve on that front. Bioshock 1 did have elements of it, but Bioshock 2 delved much more into it, looking deeper into the relationship between the big daddies and the sisters. What is different with Bioshock 2 compared to the examples I just listed are the fact that we are a silent protagonist. Maybe that's why it's been a bit lost in the shuffle. That said, I don't think the game loses a ton of that emotional punch as a result, but it has to be noted. While the story between us and Eleanor Lamb is powerful, we can't talk about this without looking at arguably the most tragic story of the game, that of Mark Meltzer and his daughter, Cindy. But here it is, and it's real. Rapture. Originally not supposed to be in the game, Mark Meltzer comes from the ARG the game had prior to release, There's Something in the Sea and was such a hit that he was eventually added in. Mark's daughter Cindy was kidnapped on the surface, and after much investigation, Mark discovers the city of Rapture where she had been taken. We follow his journey on the audio logs he leaves behind, and we just know that there's not going to be a happy ending here. 
We know that should he find his daughter, which he does, he's going to be seeing a little sister, which is exactly what happens. And it's optional depending on how you decide to counter the big daddies, but after taking down one late in the game, we see its name is not given as a big daddy, but as Mark Meltzer. There's a tape on him where, caught by Lamb, Mark becomes big daddy to be with her. There's no fanfare, there's no cutscene, but it just hits like a ton of bricks when you realize what happened. Ask yourself, Mr. Meltzer. Is it better to be summarily executed as an outsider caught within these grounds? Or to be united, not just with your daughter Cindy, but with the Rapture family as well? The choice is yours. I urge you to accept the Protector program. You will live by her side and remember nothing beyond your love for her. <laughs> I wasn't the first to find Rapture. You crazy bitch. And I won't be the last. You do. Whatever you want to me. As long as I'm with Cindy, I'm, I'm a happy man. This is such a fantastic yet tragic story beat. It's a great story of someone having their daughter taken away from them and them doing everything in their power to gang them back. Mark Meltzer is like an older version of Liam Neeson and Taken for how much he goes through in order to find her, only his story ends in tragedy. And then, should you rescue his daughter Cindy, who is with them, that just makes knowing what happened to her even worse. That her father was, for a time, her big daddy. In the span of about five minutes of audio logs spread throughout the game and some environmental storytelling, the story of Mark Meltzer hits extremely hard. This story could have made for a very interesting DLC. Hell, it would have made for a very compelling game to be fleshed out on. But there's one section in particular that I think is not only Bioshock's too fine a scene that hits like a ton of bricks, but possibly the finest scene in the entire series, in the grand scheme of games, a terribly underappreciated section that I, I wonder why more people don't talk about it. Go play with Spooky Daddy! The scene I am talking about, of course, is taking the viewpoint of a little sister later in the game. When this moment happened, it took me a moment to process. Wait a minute, why does everything look so different? And then, it hits you that this is the world that the little sister sees. They see people as angels with rose petals around them. Everything is so shiny and bright. Look at how Big Daddy looks to her. Look at how the Splicers look to her in their masks. For collecting the suit of the Big Sister, we see that she sees it as a dress. And we get some brief moments as a little sister where it cuts back and forth between reality and what they see. It's another jolt that gives a lot more context to the lives of the little sister and an incredibly powerful insight. It's an incredible moment of show don't tell where something like this could have been conveyed in recording, but instead we get to see it ourselves through the eyes of a little sister. It's an incredible moment that gives a whole different perspective to Rapture and adds a layer of depth and tragedy to this world. It amazes me that this scene doesn't get held up in such high regard compared to the Would You Kindly scene or other ones because it's such a powerful scene that says so much in such a short period of time. Here, Mousy Mousy! Why does Bioshock 2 seem to get a bit lost in the shuffle when it comes to discussion in the Bioshock series and the gaming landscape as a whole? While the game did underperform on the front of sales expected by 2K, it's not like it sold drastically less than Bioshock 1. On that note, of all the games to get a sequel, Bioshock seemed like one that didn't really need one and that the game wrapped up nicely as a whole in the end. Early on in the development, the team behind Bioshock 2 were looking to take in a different direction away from Rapture, but the higher-ups wanted them to go back to the world of Rapture. So that skepticism of coming into this world did play a part in a game that didn't overly need a sequel. But the team went in excellent directions in focusing more on that compelling relationship between the big daddies and little sisters. Another mention of why it's not remembered as much is the lack of a plot twist that for whatever reason I've seen people use this against Bioshock 2 because it doesn't have a plot twist like Bioshock does. Again, as I mentioned earlier in the video from Jordan Thomas, the creative director, the team made the choice to not make use of a plot twist and go back to that well of a storytelling technique. And yes, while the plot twist of Bioshock is extremely well done, it does seem to overshadow the rest of the story in Bioshock, which is still very well put together. And that's the problem with the plot twist tool. I see it more of a in case of emergency break class kind of tool where you only want to use sparingly. Using it too much gets tiresome and predictable, and you end up someone like M. Night Shyamalan who went to that well too many times and ended up being known as the plot twist guy. As well, we have to address the Ken Levine factor. After the release of Bioshock, Ken Levine became, for better lack of a term, one of those rockstar game developers that most gamers know the name of. This is reserved for just a few, with people like Hideo Kojima or Miyamoto. Instead of working on Bioshock 2, 
Ken and Parva's team went to go work on Bioshock Infinite with more or less free reign and no constraints. While Bioshock 2 did have a number of people working on it from the original, it could be seen more as a B-team, like what happened with Dark Souls 2 when Miyazaki was off working on Bloodborne. And Ken Levine has this magic touch of making games like Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite sell well and has fans and critics at his fingertips, even if over time the cracks appeared, but at launch, that doesn't matter. And Bioshock 2 doesn't have that, it's much more emotionally driven than more of the bombastic approach that Bioshock and Bioshock Infinite took, not going with huge twists or turns that get you to think everything that came before that. And that's fine, instead they delved into one of the most fascinating aspects of Rapture with the relationship between big daddies and little sisters, and went to tug on your heartstrings as opposed to tugging at your mind. It took the foundation of what came before in Bioshock, fixed a number of the gameplay flaws to make a really fun game. It created a worthy sequel for a game that didn't necessarily need one, and made the best of it with a short two-year development. By no stretches is it perfect, and that first hour or so is quite clunky, but once it gets going, it keeps building and building to a fantastic crescendo. And that's not even talking about Minerva's Den, which may regard as the best piece of Bioshock content, one of the best DLCs of all time. But that, my Taffer friends, is for another day. Well, my friends, those are my thoughts on Bioshock 2. Give it another try if it's been a while. I hope you enjoyed it. Check out some of my other videos. If you enjoyed, leave a comment how you feel about Bioshock 2. Leave a like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, ring my bell, baby. You know all that jazz. Anyways, I'm way overdue for going back to punching boulders, so boulder punch out.